Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy, and I'm once again joined by my special guest, Dr. Dan Wilson, a working molecular biologist and host of Debunk the Funk with Dr. Wilson here on YouTube. Uh, that's a great channel. Uh, if you think I get in depth, you got to go see this guy. He really breaks down things very, very well. So, Dr. Wilson, welcome. How are you today? Hey, Bob. Happy to be here. Doing well today. How you doing? Got your little one down? All right. Well, we're going to continue our series on the disinformation dozen. I think that we ought to really just hit the elephant in the room. Let's go with the biggie. Dr. Andrew Wakefield. A lot of people seem to think that he is the one that started all of this, but there have been anti-vaxxers around since the smallpox vaccinations in the 19th century. Since they use material from cowpox to vaccinate for smallpox, one of the things that you would see in cartoons and newspapers is illustrations of people turning into cows. Mm -hmm. Dr. Andrew Wakefield made his mark in medicine by publishing a paper in Lancet back in the 90s, trying to link the MMR vaccination against autism. What happened with that? Yeah, so I think that he really helped popularize the anti-vax movement. And when it came to MMR and autism, um, he took advantage of celebrities, well-known celebrities who had children with autism and used them to kind of amplify his disinformation, which of course had a grift to it. He was making his own MMR vaccine. It was a univalent vaccine uh, just for the measles. Mm -hmm. He said that the trivalent That's true. MMR vaccination caused autism, but his special univalent vaccine didn't. Yes, that's right. It was so MMR is for measles, mumps and rubella for those who may not know, but Andrew Wakefield was making his own measles specific vaccine, which he claimed somehow didn't cause autism, even though no vaccine causes autism. Andrew Wakefield did it in a very devious way. So he's famous for having published a paper where his thesis was essentially that the MMR vaccine with its live weakened measles virus causing autism in children. Essentially, his idea was that the virus in the vaccine was replicating in the lymph nodes of the gut of children and causing autism. So to demonstrate this, he actually fabricated PCR data from samples that he unethically took from children. So not only were the samples unethically obtained, but the data were fraudulent. And we can actually see that when we look at the PCR data. So Dr. Wilson, I see you have an illustration up here. Uh, can you walk us through what PCR is and how it works? Yeah, so essentially PCR is a method where we are looking for specific sequences of DNA in a complex sample that has DNA or nucleic acid from all different sources. So what you're saying, Dr. Wilson, is the measles virus is an RNA virus, and I can take a sample from a patient and then go through this, this process called PCR and identify it. Uh, how does PCR work, and how, how can I identify a measles virus from a very tiny piece of material? Yeah, so it all comes down to these purple things called primers. These are primers that the experimenter designed to seek out measles uh, RNA in this case. So measles is going measles. So measles RNA is going to be specific. It's unique to the virus, right? It's not going to be. Um, so there are parts of the measles virus that are unique to the measles virus, and that makes it the measles virus, right? You're not going to find these specific parts of this virus in polio or in you and I that like the like the cells of you and I or a or cauliflower I anything yeah or a cauliflower anything you're only going to find these specific sequences in measles so these primers are designed to specifically seek out a target so in PCR uh, what the researchers can do is they can go through these cycles where the DNA is heated uh, or in this case the RNA uh, PCR can work with any nucleic acid but the point is that the two strands will separate 
And then the primers will come in and bind their specific targets. And then in the next stage, an enzyme will come and use that primer to initiate a replication reaction. The cycle is then over. The two strands will by complementary base pairing, reanneal again, and the cycle starts all over. And you keep replicating and replicating until you get copies of your product, your target that you're looking for. So we go in and we heat the sample. That makes the DNA and the RNA in the cells separate. We put in a tag that is specific to measles virus and then let it cool again. And then once it cools in the presence of an enzyme that we add, it will reform into two copies from the original one copy. And then we just keep repeating that cycle and we can make a, a very large amount of, of measles RNA at the end of this process. And that makes it a lot easier to identify. Then we, then we do a test on that to see whether or not there's actually measles RNA present in the sample. And that's, that's how we get sufficient quantities in order to test it. Is that right? So this process is going to produce your target sequence a lot, and it's going to produce it enough so that it rises way above levels of any other um, nucleic acid uh, in the sample. And so with qPCR, we have a way of detecting these copies of product as they are being created. So it's called real-time PCR, uh, sometimes abbreviated qPCR. Do you have an so, example of that? Oh, yes. So here's some example data where we see on the bottom x-axis here, there are the cycles. It goes out from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. On the y-axis here, we have a change in uh, relative light units. So how we are detecting the amplification of DNA is basically with a fluorescent probe. and there's a way that works. Uh, you can look up a qPCR reaction specifically if you want to know how the probe works in all of this reaction. But what you need to know is that as the cycles progress, a positive sample should look something like this, where at first it's stationary, then it goes into a logarithmic, um, a logarithmic amplification phase, and it eventually levels off. That's what you would expect from a positive sample in qPCR. These are negative controls, this NTC and a, a negative control. Um, so a negative control is a um, target that should not be detected, and an NTC is just no DNA or no nucleic acid added. These samples will creep up as the cycles increase due to decay of the probe, the fluorescent probe, but they won't rise to this exponential or logarithmic phase. So during data analysis, in order to help scientists distinguish between positive and negative samples, there's this threshold that will be set by uh, usually the software itself. This threshold will be placed just as the samples begin to enter their uh, exponential growth phase. What Andrew Wakefield did in looking, and we can know this by looking at their raw data, was that when he had these samples from these children, all of them were negative. It was clearly just decay of the probe, but someone moved this threshold down at the very end of the cycle number. These samples that Andrew Wakefield tested rose above this threshold and gave a false positive. That's very so that's, interesting. So what's the end result of all of this, Dr. Wilson? What do you, what's your thought on it? So basically what we can tell is that from Andrew Wakefield's data, there was no measles virus replicating in the lymph nodes of these children's guts who he unethically took samples from. So his thesis that measles virus from the vaccine was replicating in their guts causing autism was complete bogus. In other words, he falsified his data. Yeah, and that's partly why his papers were retracted. Partly. Now, 
I've actually done quite a series on Andrew Wakefield and just a little bit of background on, on him as well. Uh, he was a researcher at, I think it was Queen's Hospital in London, and a gastroenterologist is what he was, was doing. And he was contacted by a group of attorneys in the United Kingdom that were interested in suing the vaccine manufacturers. Uh, and that lawsuit was on the behest of a anti-vax group in the UK called Jabs. So they hired the attorneys. The attorneys looked to Andrew Wakefield as an expert. You know, that's what attorneys do. I, I'm an expert for some legal groups here, uh, helping veterans get disability. They consult me as an independent medical evaluator. Now, while there's nothing wrong with that, the problem was is that Andrew Wakefield hid the support of those attorneys. They established some sort of a charitable trust that they put money in, and that charitable trust gave money to Andrew Wakefield to hide the fact that it came from the attorneys in the first place. That was number one. Number two was he was patenting, he was attempting to patent a univalent measles vaccine and was interested in getting the MMR vaccine off the market in favor of his vaccine. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you know, he got a little bit of, of fame out of this. And he was big man on campus at Queens Hospital. However, he only did this with about 15 children, uh, none of which developed autism in the immediate period of time after they received a vaccination. Uh, many of these children have been showing symptoms of autism for many years prior. Some did not develop symptoms of autism until years afterwards. If you're interested in the full discussion of all of this, I have a series of about five videos uh, that I did on it, and I go through this all in detail. The bottom line is they had a change in administration at the hospital, and the hospital brought in a new chief of medicine who looked at Andrew Wakefield's study and said, look, dude, you've got 15 people here. We want you to do a second study that involves at least 100 children. And, you know, we want very clear results from this. We don't want these ambiguous results that you're reporting. They weren't aware of the falsified data. They were just aware that it was a tiny little sample size. And they demanded that he do it on a much larger one, which is common in science, is it not? Yeah. yeah. Uh, would you ever report something as paradigm shifting as this based on a handful of, of results? Wouldn't you want to be damn no. sure that you were right before you staked your entire reputation on this? He simply did not, and he resisted their efforts to the point that he just ended up resigning. And then he went through all of this with the British Medical Board. Now, the British Medical Board primarily nailed him for violation of um, ethics standards. Uh, not so much speaking about his study, but the way that he did it. And he, you know, paying children $5 to get blood samples at a birthday party in California. He had business dealings with the parents of the children where they were going to market this special test for measles that would, would help you make your case in court in the event of a lawsuit. You know, these are things that he did. What happened after he lost his medical license in the UK? He went to Austin, Texas and went into something called the Thoughtful House. And this was a quote unquote autism information center. And, you know, he just continued on this. He tried to start a television series with Dale Bigtree where they rescued autistic children that were institutionalized and brought them home and used his ideas on them. The reason that he's a member of the Disinformation Dozen now is not only based on his great contributions to disinformation in the anti in the anti-vax movement, but he's a filmmaker now. You know, he's making making films with Dale Bigtree, one of which was Vax. Did you ever see that? Yep, I saw it a while ago, and I actually plan on making a video about it sometime this year. What was your impression of it? So I watched it a while ago, but my memory is that it was just your typical anti-vaccine documentary with uh, that pulls out all the traditional cards that you would expect from 
conspiracy theorists by propping up fake experts, um, having unrealistic expectations of science, um, cherry picking particular incorrect uh, statements or studies that have been thoroughly debunked um, and making claims that just are not evidence-based. Uh, that's my general memory of it. Um, it. It does that. It's just a cookie cutter anti-vaccine conspiracy documentary. Vaxxed and Plandemic, I think was the other yeah. one that came out. Uh, basically, you know, it's like looking at flat earthers. Uh, they rehash the same arguments that they've been making since 2014. And they never listen. You know, they ask the same questions, but they still never listen to the answers. And then tomorrow, they'll ask the same question again. Um, that's very typical of conspiratorial documentaries. You can think of a number of them. Uh, vaxxed, pandemic, a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. You know, uh, it, it's just... They're all there, man. It, they just hit all the same buttons. So what's up with so what's up with good old Doctor Wakefield right now? You know, currently, um, I think Wakefield has taken a more behind the scenes role when it comes to anti vaxxers. You know, he's been pretty thoroughly discredited publicly. Uh, so now the front men are kind of this quote unquote new school generation of anti-vaxxers you know um the robert malone's the peter mccullough's other people in the disinformation dozen uh such as joe mercola they're they're kind of the faces of anti-vaccine movements now whereas i think andrew wakefield has kind of as you said taken a behind the scenes role by helping to make films um organizing events i believe he did do some speaking events during the pandemic uh, to speak out about anti-vaccine stuff, but um, that's my impression of what he's doing now. Well, let's clarify that a little bit, because there are some very interesting things that I'd like to show you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right, can you see this okay? Yes. Now, one of the problems that you run into with the anti-vax pandemic profiteers is they're basically businesses. And one of the things that they tend to do is they tend to be mutually supportive businesses. If you look at this chart that I have, it's got name and then it's got the truth about vaccines, the truth about cancer, vaccines revealed, and the Health Freedom Summit. These are events that occurred that were hosted by these anti-vax pandemic profiteers. So, so, so for example, under the Health Freedom Summit, you'll see that Dr. Andrew Wakefield and Barbara Lowe Fisher are the promoters. Robert F. Kennedy is a promoter, Larry Cook is a promoter, and Sherry Tenpenny are promoters. Del Bigtree is speaking, Joe Mercola is speaking, and Ty and Charlene Bollinger are speakers at this particular thing. Now let's go over to Vaccines Revealed in the middle. Barbara Lowe Fisher is the promoter, Andrew Wakefield is a speaker at that one. So is Del Bigtree, and the rest are all promoters. So they're, the promoters are the ones making the money. The speakers are the talent. Now let's look at the truth about vaccines and the truth about cancer. Um, obviously, uh, the owners are, are Ty and Charlene. You've got all these promoters, and Joe Mercola is speaking. Andrew Wakefield is a featured speaker. All right, so basically what they're doing is they are bringing in, you know, they're acting as headliners at each other's events. So you have people that host these conferences and they invite their buddies in. And then those people will host conferences and the first people will go in and act as speakers for them to bring, bring people in. The other thing that they seem to do is they, they seem to be selling mailing lists between each other because each of these people pay for contacts of susceptible individuals. Uh, and what better way of doing that than getting a, um, getting a mailing list for your organization so Kennedy will sell his mailing list to McCola. McCola will sell his, his mailing list to the Bollingers. The Bollingers will sell their, their mailing list back up to Kennedy. And that way there, what they do is they, they, they market these, these susceptible individuals between themselves. And we're going to see a lot more of that in the future. But that's what Andrew Wakefield is doing right now. He's paid 
to come in as a speaker to these organizations on the order of $3,000 a pop, plus, of course, expenses. Wow. And that's one of the ways, that, that, that's one of the reasons apparently he's living out on a yacht right now. But that's the way these folks are working this. I mean, they're, they're, it's a marketing scheme more than anything. You know, this isn't yeah. science. This is marketing. And, yeah. um, and it's, it's being repeated today that there are certain popular COVID anti-vaxxers who are charging ten or 20000 a pop to show up and speak at an event. Yeah. So it's, it, it is, as you said, we'll, we'll see more of it in the future. Well, this data that I'm, I'm quoting, and you can see the actual um, data in the reports for the Center for the Control of Digital Hate, they actually have all the tax documents and everything in support of all this. Mm -hmm. The court hearings where they're talking about being deplatformed by YouTube and how much money they're losing and how much how much reach they're losing and how, mu how much that reach is worth to them. It's all documented in there, in that report, in the footnotes. And they actually attach files of these tax documents. So you can go in and look at the actual thing that was filed with the government. So Dr. Wilson, you're familiar with Andrew Wakefield. I'm familiar with Andrew Wakefield. How would you sum him up? I think I'd sum him up as the guy who popularized one of the most despicable anti-vaccine claims out there. That, uh, namely, the idea that vaccines cause autism. And they don't. He had to fabricate his data because he knows that they don't. He just really was trying to make this whole thing a money grab. And, you know, instead of leaving behind a legacy of being a decent doctor, he's his only legacy is going to be one of being a very despicable anti-vaxxer. And I think that's a real shame for him. It is. Um, he had such great potential and mm -hmm. he squandered it. The entire thing was based on, on a fraud. It was an effort to shake down a pharmaceutical company. It was an effort to hide the fact that it was a shakedown of a pharmaceutical company. It was an effort to make money by marketing this idea to worried and vulnerable parents. You know, I have a child that is on the spectrum. And one of the problems that you run into is we don't know what causes autism. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the first clue what causes autism, how are you going to say that this causes it? We don't know what causes it. When you have a child, when you have a child that has issues like that, and, 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 and mine was relatively mild, you always wonder whether it was something that you did. Is it something that you physically did? Is it something that you genetically did? Is it an environmental issue that you exposed your child to? And to have a shuckster come in and tell you, no, it's not your fault, it's the vaccine's fault, therefore, you know, you, you can rest easy at night and we'll, we'll make it right with a vaccine company. We'll get rid of this nasty product and save other people from doing it. So not only do you somehow feel better that you have a reason that this happened, uh, you are reassured that it wasn't your fault and that the people that, that were responsible for it will be held accountable. And that is a very powerful marketing scheme. We've seen that in many cases in history. All right. Mm -hmm. We saw it in Nazi yeah. Germany. We saw it a little bit more recently where we demonize people of a certain religion uh, simply because they're of that religion. We demonize people that aren't like us. It's very easy to blame your pro your problems on somebody else. And if yeah. you have somebody like Wakefield that takes advantage of that, very powerful. Mm -hmm. With that said, uh, I think we should should end it here. I think that the next one that we should talk about is probably one of the worst, the top three worst of the disinformation dozen. And that is Del Big Tree.
So everybody go on over and check out Dr. Wilson's channel, Debunk the Funk with Dr. Wilson. The link will be right down in the, de in the description of this video. I think you'll enjoy it. So until then, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Take care and stay healthy, folks. Get your vaccinations.